this is Jez Ralph. Some of you will know Jez. He's been part of the timber sector for quite a while. Someone was looking at the inspired architecture, timber architecture from Howden Forest in, in Devon. And I remember meeting Jez for the first time when I was interviewed for some work there. Um, and he, he has worked more recently at the park and uh, a whole load of places, Connecticut uh, Bath University. Maybe you'd like to very quickly give a quick pre and then go into what you're going to talk about and explain the relationship and connection with Amy and Lantern and the crossover and overlap. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Did you get that? Um, can, you, can you hear all the voices? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, yes, I can hear you, yes. Uh, you can hear you could oh, the <laughs> there. Sorry, I know you don't have microphones, but it's just, it doesn't matter. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. It's just, it's just there. That's fine. Okay, just talk to them all. You <laughs> Um, I was just uh, introducing you, Jez, to our, our audience here, saying that we met quite some time ago, and I was going to ask you to just crazy what you do, and also the connection with Amy and the overlap, and to, to introduce what you're talking about in relation to setting up uh, local resource timber networks and roadside collection and alternative uses rather than uh, all the ash die back and other roadside wood going to biomass. Um, so that's, so yeah, off we go. Excellent. Great. You have my screen now? Yes, we do. Fantastic. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, that's it. Technologies work. Thanks for coming out on a Friday evening. Um, in talk, I think we've got about 15 minutes, haven't we? Um, about uh, the work we do with low value timber, including diseased timber. Um, and there's, it, it's a collaborative piece of work. I'll explain a bit about myself in a second. But the, it's a collaboration between Lantern, which is an environmental consultant city based in London, that are very much involved in urban forestry in London, as well as sustainability and the built environment, and a lot of community and education work, which complements very well with what I do. And I have a small consultancy, Timber Strategies, we're based down in Devon, which is probably why I'm not there this evening, the south coast being as long as it is. And, um, yeah, as Oliver said, we've been involved together for quite a number of years now because I work in this sort of grey area between timber growing and timber using. So we do a lot of supply chain integration work. Uh, we've worked with people like Baston Timber on the development of thermally modified ash using a lot of ash direct timber. Um, and we do a lot of work with schools of architecture as well. So quite a lot of the London schools of architecture we do a bit of teaching at. And we're quite involved in landscape development on its broader scale as well as timber development. And so Amy and I came together a few years ago because we were approached by a, um, a developer who was taking down a lot of trees on a development site and it was our first introduction to urban forestry I guess. And it was sort of came to our attention that urban trees, low value trees, roadside trees are often purely um, aesthetic in their contribution to the landscape and when they're taken down that seems problematic rather than an opportunity whereas certainly for me coming from a forestry background we never see trees in that way at all and at the same time um, 
there's about to be a huge decrease in the amount of available timber from forests. And this graph in the middle is the forecast decrease in productive volume of timber from UK forests over the next sort of 50 to 80 years. And it's very plain to see how you know, there's potentially losing sort of 50% of the productive volume of forestry. And so suddenly this urban forestry becomes more important from not just an aesthetic ecological uh, point of view, but as a crucial cultural system. It, it's part of our forested landscape and I've always felt we should treat it as such and suddenly working with land lease on uh, the development of Elephant Park we had an opportunity to see what the potential was to use timber from urban forests as uh, considered material and this bottom image is uh, a set of timber samples that have come off what we'd normally consider to be incredibly poor trees and it turns out and we'll see in a bit that actually urban timber and roadside timber produces incredibly high value timber. Uh, and so this is sort of uh, an infographic of what we do with developers. You know, first of all, there's a resource assessment part of it, and I think it's fair to say that right at the start we thought we'd get very little sawwood from uh, roadside timber, but in fact that's turned out not to be true at all. And then we can start identifying best uses for that timber. So I suppose different from a conventional forest, using roadside low-value timber is very much um, supply dictated rather than demand dictated. You have to look at what the timber is and then put it into an identifiable use rather than someone coming and saying we need so much sawwood for this project. It's very difficult to do that when you're dealing with this uh, more uh, variable resource. And then what we normally do is take the problem off the developer's hands or the local authority's hands or whoever it is by once that timber's come down, we take it away, we make it into whatever it is that the client needs to be made from, from it. And so we treat it, we treat these sites very much like forest. You know, we divide it up into felling coops. We treat each section as if it was a stand in a forest. And we measure the timber in a very conventional forestry way. For each tree, we know how much volume we're going to get out of it. And we supply the felling contractors with the right information to know which trees to keep, which not to, what length of timber we need out of it, etc, etc, etc. So, you know, although this is in zone 1, it's being treated as a forest resource. The kind of solutions we're looking at, we're looking at the suitability of the wood, the quantity of the wood, what the aspirations are. So this is very much an idea that the timber coming off a site is going back into a site. So for roadside trees, for instance, by, used by local authorities, it might be going into bus shelters or public domain. For um, developers, it might be going into public spaces within buildings or within developments. And there's always quite a lot of very poor timber or conventionally poor timber that can go to the community uses and engagement uses in local schools. And so, just like the urban forest being treated like a conventional forest, the timber itself is treated as conventional timber. We, a forwarder comes in, it takes the timber, it gets sawed. Uh, in this case, the bottom middle picture shows the sawwood being quarter sawed because it is going to furniture eventually, and we're very lucky enough to have contacts that will either plane or quarter saw for us. And quarter sawing will give us a much more stable product to build from. And um, the kind of end uses we're looking at are incredibly variable. So this is material from Ellen Park from the Lent Blues project. And you can kind of see from it um, the kind of policy we're looking at. So 
some of it is indoor furniture, some of it outdoor furniture. Um, one of the problems we find with roadside trees and sort of trees that have been grown for immunity, for some reason, and I'm still not quite sure why, people choose trees that give non-durable timber. And so actually making outdoor furniture can be rather difficult to out of it. However, the quality of the timber is normally so good that uh, this middle image, for instance, outdoor furniture, um, all came out of one tree. And this issue of quality is quite interesting. So if we go back a couple, we can see these trees here, and this sort of middle image, a London plane, tree 18, I think it is. Um, we've actually got quite a lengthy saw log out of this. You know, although it looks like a very poor timber in terms of conventional timber quality trees, Actually, we've got a good length of timber, we've got a reasonable diameter, because all these trees have been pruned successively so that people can walk under them, machinery can get under them on roads, so trucks and vehicles can get under them, same on railway lines. And actually, what we found is that we originally thought we'd get, say, 10 or 20 percent conversion rate from these trees. What we actually end up getting is 80, 70 to 80 percent conversion rate from them, which is generally more than you're getting from a lot of forest trees. And so, in this particular instance, what we did was we ran a furniture making competition amongst local furniture makers around Elephant Park and created um, furniture for reception areas and for communal areas within the developments. And then, once we've used all that very primary grade timber, we then looked at how we could potentially use the second grade timber. So in this case, um, this uh, shelving of the side is all made of timber that's come off this side. So you know, this place that timber's sitting, is this place those trees came from and that's a really compelling story for the site and for the use of these trees that people only envisaged as uh, a visual thing originally suddenly become a new visual thing in a new life um, and then of course we have a lot of third grade timber there's a lot of timber that just can't be used and whilst these images aren't particularly Good. We've used the uh, lower grade timber for art installations. We've commissioned artists to make pieces uh, on the left for a space inside one of the developments, and on the right, a school project that used some of the timber that tried to explain the value of the park and the communal spaces. And then, of course, there's an awful lot of branch material left, and it's very easy to say, as we would in a conventional forestry sense, well, we'll just uh, we'll mulch that, that can go away. Um, but, uh, but actually, it's incredibly useful material. So in this case, we a lot of it went to schools for projects. Um, a lot of projects we did on site, so we ran these workshops, spoon carving workshops. We made a lot of habitat. Uh, items, bird boxes, bat boxes, insect hotels, this kind of thing, using all this timber that's come off the site, and it suddenly brings the local community in, it engages them, and we can start to tell the story that these trees around them, although they're very beautiful to look at and are worth being there, actually at the end of their life, which will come at some point, they can actually be still be a useful part of the community afterwards. And it's sort of on a wider scale, I guess, for, as well as these projects we undertake in urban forestry, it's worth thinking about the fact that what we think of as poor quality timber often isn't poor quality timber at all. And we're at a point now where perhaps we need to readdress what we think of as quality in trees. And I think these three examples are incredibly compelling. Um, and on the left here, we have 
the uh, grid shell of Windsor Park, the Savile Building, and of course, uh, th this timber came out of a forest. It's uh, all large, I think, but the fact is that it's cross-cut, it's defect cut, all defects taken out, you end up with relatively short lengths that are then finger jointed together to make incredibly long lengths of timber that can then create these grid shell domes. And actually, as a demonstrator of how you can potentially use poor, poorer quality, conventionally poorer quality timber, this is an incredible example. And then in the middle here, we have the ice ring from the Vancouver Olympics. And um, what's not a particularly good image, actually, what you have is a, here is a very large span timber roof that is entirely made of diseased timber. And um, part of what was going on here was the idea was to use uh, an expanding resource of beetle killed timber in Canada and demonstrate that it can be used for high profile, very well considered engineered applications. And perhaps this is a trick we're missing in the UK. There's people like Fast and Timber um, that are you know, demonstrating the use of ash as um, in thermally modified products, but perhaps we need to be better at thinking about how we use tree, disease trees because the surest algorithm is being more disease that's coming into the country. And then on the right here, if anyone isn't familiar with it, is the um, the Woodchip Barnes Book Park that uses uh, beach forks and otherwise completely waste product. You know, these couldn't even be used for firewood, they couldn't be sold for firewood because they're so difficult to process, yet they're used here to create the structure of um, a very unique and compelling building as an example of how low value timber could be used. It's a pretty amazing structure. And then finally, um, I think this is the final slide. Let's be, let's be aspiring and inspiring in how we use this timber. And I like these two images mainly because I like cycling and I like skiing. And here we have two incredibly well engineered products that probably leave structural applications in buildings standing leagues back. And actually, you know, they both use very short length timber, but good quality timber, not free timber, to make products that undergo rigors that a building will never see the lights on. And actually, if we can start with these and say, well, if you can make a backcountry ski and you can make a mountain bike out of short length hardwood timber, or even diseased timber, then actually we can use it for anything else. And that is sort of very quick um, uh, overview of our uh, direction and where we're going. We have many projects. The, this uh, urban forestry and low value timber is one of them. And this final image, of course, is going right back to historic timber buildings where actually, if you look at them, the quality of the timber in them is other than in very high profile big buildings, universally what we would now call pretty terrible quality. And most of them have been standing for a great many centuries. Thank you very much.